believe that reasonably close to the fast-paced action of a Detroit area automobile manufacturing plant, one would begin this search for narrow gauge Mikados. This is Buick City in Flint, Michigan. We are on our way to the Huckleberry Railroad in Flint. The Huckleberry Railroad Crossroads Village is located in a picturesque setting in Flint. A living, breathing K-27 class Mike makes its first test run over the line. It is number 464. On this day, it was steamed up for the first time since rebuilding. This class of Mikado was the first for the Rio Grande, and there were 15 in its class. Originally operated as compound types with slide valves, many were upgraded to simple piston valves and superheaters. It was during such a conversion that the boiler from number 454 was used to rebuild the 464. This engine was purchased from Knott's Berry Farm in California and originally from the Rio Grande. It was originally sold to Knott's in November 1973. Passenger car number 306 came from the Denver and Rio Grande and was used on the Chile line. It later served on the Silverton out of Durango. So, old friends meet again. another test run of the 464. A good fire is built up in the boiler by fireman Ray Cash. Anyone who has run a steam engine knows the value of placing the coal properly in the firebox. 160 pounds of pressure was the maximum needed since the superheater units were removed. This resulted in a significant reduction in power. The wheels of the 464 are barely visible. Casual observers rarely notice their absence. Outside frame construction with revolving counterweights gave the mics a unique look. It was special enough to give this original mic class a name, Mudheads. The doghouse on the top of the tender deck was added to house an electrical generator. The 453 had a doghouse applied during a tender rebuild, but no other K-27 received one. Sufficiently filled with water, the mic backs to couple to the passenger train. As the time approaches for departure, the engineer spots oil on a number of moving parts. Oiling took place frequently on older engines each time the train stopped. Watch for the wheel slip and the resulting smoke from the stack as the K-27 tries to accelerate.
Flint engineer Marty Knox blows the whistle for a crossing. And 464 high balls across the park. The train next rounds the West Loop. Crossing the trestle along Mott Lake, the 464 portrays what narrow-gauge railroading is all about. Colorful, quaint, and picturesque. The Crossroads Village Station was not the only station to witness the passing of three-foot-gauge mics and cars. The station at Silverton, Colorado still hosts daily runbys of Rio Grande Mikes in the warmer months. Silverton, Colorado lies on the floor of Baker's Park, a mining town when first built, and still a mining town to some extent. The town is patronized by tourists from the Durango and Silverton in the warmer months. This colorful, picturesque, and remote town was not only the northern terminal of the Rio Grande, but supported three other narrow-gauge railroads in times past. The Silverton Northern, the Silverton Gladstone and Northern, and the Silverton Railway all served the town during its mining heyday. That's the old Silverton Northern engine house behind and to the left of the Silverton station. Silverton's last mill was the Mayflower. By contrast, Durango is a thriving city surviving thanks to the DNS Railroad, many tourist attractions, and a large entrenched community. During the warmer months, throngs of crowds ply the streets and mill around the station. On any morning, the beehive of activity is dramatic as each train is made up and heads north towards Silverton. a number of hours of this activity into just a few minutes to dramatize its intensity.
after another fast-paced morning, the guard is probably happy to close the yard gates. The new roundhouse looms in the background. The new roundhouse very favorably matches the architecture of the old one, destroyed in a fire in 1989. Casual access to the yard is quite restricted. The constant possibility of a train sneaking up on an unsuspecting trespasser has required a fairly high degree of security. We are fortunate enough to catch Mike number 473 switching some cars during the midday's lull. One can witness many varied scenes from the train. Here, a rider and horse try to keep up with the train. Here, a pop car precedes the first train of the morning. It'll check out track conditions in advance. Rockwood is located at milepost 469. This portion of the line leaves almost all breathless as trains hug the side of a cliff set well above the Animus River. Photographer Tim Ladd has captured this scene from locations few people have ever seen. Construction crews were suspended from ropes in order to place black powder used for blasting into holes on the side of the cliffs. Finally, the tracks cross the Animus River a few miles north, where they terminate their hug along the sheer rock cliffs. The sign aptly states we are 7,200 feet above sea level. Needleton is located at milepost 480.3. Several good mining prospects were established in this area. A new water tank has been erected here, and after taking on water, K-28 Mike number 478 whistles off. At Elk Park, milepost 490.47, the Rio Grande installed a new high line in 1964. The older bridges still exist in the background. The old tank at Needleton is no longer used, as is evident by the dropping of the tank bands. As these tanks dry out, the wood staving shrinks. This is the first Silverton run of the day, running late after the side rods struck a rock which had fallen close to the tracks. Tourist railroad? Yes. Mountain railroading? Yes, sir. The San Juan Express has arrived in Silverton, 
unloaded its passengers, and is now backing to the Y to turn the train. The unusual location of the air pump was unique to this K-28 class of mics. They were dubbed the Sport Models, purchased during the Rio Grande's Capital Improvement Program of 1923 to 24. They were the only narrow gauge mics ever ordered from Alco. They were designed to offer both freight and passenger service. They were delivered with superheaters and piston valves and were unlike the K-27s, which were saturated steam compound types with slide valves and lower pressures. The air compressor was located on the front for clearance considerations. With the Grand's introduction of these engines, motive power failures dropped by 81%. The brakeman clears the air and signals the train to stop. Then he jumps off the train, throws the switch, and checks the switch marker and points before backing the train and climbing aboard. K-36, number 480, soon arrives and pulls up 12th Street next to the San Juan Express. Back at Elk Park, we catch a grand view of Electric Peak as the 481 passes our vantage point. We are still at Elk Park. The next train to arrive is the third Silverton named train of the day, and it is headed by number 497, a class K37. This was the last year the 497 ran on the DNS. It was sold to the Cumbrace and Toltec. Very shortly, the San Juan Express passes the 497 and train. Once the 476 clears the siding, the 497 will continue north.
We are near the snow shed slide at milepost 492 along the Animus River. The first southbound Silverton sets off this attractive scene of rushing water and canyon walls. The last Silverton train of the day crosses the Animus by Cascade Y. Note the fireman leaning out of the cab. He's checking a low spot and the cars as they rock over it. Back on the High Line in Animus Canyon, the southbound train negotiates the curves. trains on the DNS are passenger. Here number 481 arrives with a work train at Rockwood. The first Silverton returns with K36 number 480 and crosses the three bridges west of town. The motor car closely following the train scoots along quite near so it too can clear the grade crossings. Auto traffic this time of day is heavy. Number 482 pulls into the downtown area and station with the second Silverton. The new roundhouse was constructed after the disastrous fire of February 1989, where the bulk of the old roundhouse was destroyed. A number of narrow gauge mics were significantly damaged, but by the fall of 1989, the railroad was back in operation with most locomotives in tip-top shape. The joy of viewing a fired up steamer in the later part of the 21st century is still difficult to comprehend. Here, locomotives built more than 70 years ago are still running strong. To capture the turning of a steam loco on a turntable is still exciting, and the DNS provides this melancholy treat on a daily basis.
Number 480 completes its run around the loop with its train. This view can be captured without entering yard property. Number 478, a K-28, next takes its turn on the table. Those spark arresters, added by the DNS, are fashioned after those found on the old Colorado and Southern. The Durango turntable is run from air supplied by the locomotive. Coaling of locos is by bucket loaders, the same system used on the Cumbres and Toltec. A ride atop K36 number 480 provides a grand view of the new roundhouse. Note the ash pit, various engines stored in the roundhouse, and portions of Rio Grande Southern number 40 undergoing rebuilding. After disconnecting the air, the 480 is moved into the roundhouse for additional servicing. Chelona Lake, north of Durango provides a picture book ending of our trip over the Durango and Silverton. The train is headed by K36 number 482. This mic was recently overhauled and is new to the DNS. The DNS plans on rebuilding number 486 for the 1993 season. Except for one K36, all the original models of this class are now operating on either the DNS or the Cumbrace and Toltec. When the Rio Grande shut most of the narrow gauge lines down in the late 60s, who would have believed all these beautiful mics would still be running 30 years later? Probably one of the most photographed stations on the old Rio Grande was also located at its highest elevation, Cumbres Pass. At just over 10,000 foot elevation, Cumbres is now listed as being on the highest steam operated railroad in North America. We are now on the Cumbres and Toltec Railroad at milepost 330.6. Chama, New Mexico is the western terminus of the Cumbres and Toltec. The railroad has developed a herald reminiscent of the old DNRGW line. In the spring of each year, the railroad must begin track maintenance in earnest. The winter snows and runoff take their toll on the line. Here, K36 number 484 pushes a short train of drop-bottom gondolas. Cinders served as excellent ballast, and the predecessor Grand used them extensively for this purpose. Little goes to waste on the narrow gauge. The work train rounds the curve near Lobo Lodge. 
This hunting and fishing operation has survived many years at this location. On another day, diesel number 19 unloads some more cinder ballast. The glamour and beauty of day-to-day narrow-gauge operations end when the job calls for shoveling cinders out of a drop-bottom gun by hand. But beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and few sights can warm the blood of a true steam fan more than watching two mics simmering behind the engine house. Mike number 484 was purchased by the C&T shortly after the sale of this portion of the Grand. Ten of these 480 series engines were built by Baldwin for the Rio Grande in 1925 and were the last new narrow gauge engines acquired by the Grand. The states of Colorado and New Mexico jointly own the C&T and the railroad is managed by Kyle Railways out of California. The only significant addition to the property is the brick engine house to the left. The original wooden roundhouse had six stalls. It burned and was replaced by a nine-stall brick roundhouse. Only two stalls remain today. Locos await their daily runs, having been kept alive during the night by the hostler. In the shadows of early morning, the lineup of passenger and converted freight cars awaits their passengers and locomotives. Ashes, which have accumulated during the night, will be shaken out. Water and coal will be added, and the mics will take their turn on the line once more.
Mike 484 next heads to the coaling facility. Note the similar operation to Durango. The original coaling tower still stands at Chama and is being rebuilt for full operation. With both engines cold, they line up in front of the daily passenger train. Today, a double-headed pull is necessary. The bridges over the Rio Chama have been a very favored place to photograph outbound trains for years. Well-known rail photographer Fred Jukes found this lone pine tree to the right and framed many a mic as it passed this location. The tree now bears his name, the Jukes tree. The train now leaves the Chama River Valley as it passes through the Narrows. At milepost 339.75, the Grand erected a steel trestle spanning Wolf Creek. The word wolf means lobato in Spanish, and the trestle was aptly named lobato. The Grand and now the CNT have followed the safety practice of separating the engines before running over lobato. The bridges cannot support the weight of two K-class mics. An often overlooked but exciting location to catch these mics is at milepost 337. Here our double header blasts its way through the S curves near Highway 17. The narrow gauge track seldom ever looked like standard gauge mainline. It was twisty, rough, and grown over with low weeds through most of its operating years. However, the CNT has kept the track in quite good condition over the years. At Coxo, the tracks cross Highway 17. As the engines thunder up the 4% grade, the safety valves have lifted on both mics. The mics will need that head of steam, for they have two more miles of 4% grade to go to Cumbrace. The mics now blast around Windy Point, aptly named because the wind blows in all directions. The train has just left Wolf Creek Valley and shortly will arrive at Cumbrace.
At Cumbres, one mic is uncoupled, and the remaining loco takes the train down the lofty summit into the Los Pinos Valley. But first, the train must round Tanglefoot Curve. This curve is aptly named, as the tracks wind back onto themselves. The railroad surveyors took advantage of the gently sloping plain to keep the grade below 4%. Pulling up the four percenter to Cumbrace, each fireman will shovel about two and a half tons of coal into the hungry firebox. Gentle S-curves provide a fine setting for the mic as it glides down through Los Pinos Valley on its way to the Los Pinos Loop. Mike 489, which served as a helper up to Cumbrace, drifts back to Chama. The 489 was turned on the Y at Cumbrace. The typical summer weather has turned into heavy thunderstorms. Back at Chama, the 489 will be turned on the Y west of town and then serviced before the fire is banked for the night. The Rio de los Pinos Valley is framed on each side by steep hills. The Rio Grande laid track in the lower portions of the valley following the Rio de los Pinos River. About midway in the long valley, the train crosses Cascade Creek over a 409-foot-long bridge. The train is dwarfed by the majestic hills as it winds its way down the valley. This is the third bridge at this location. The first was built of wood, the second of iron in 1889, and the current of steel in the 1920s. The bridge was built to standard gauge specifications, anticipating the standard gauging of this line. Photographer Tim Lab has chosen a view of this track and train from a perspective rarely seen. Osier was located one and a half miles east of Cascade Trestle. Here the C&T provides lunch for hungry passengers. Trains from Antonito and Chama arrive a half hour or so apart and a lunch break is taken by all. Antonito serves the standard gauge Rio Grande and at one time also served narrow gauge trains as well on dual gauge trackage out of Alamosa east of here. A sign flatly stating end of standard gauge sits at the west end of the yard. At milepost 291.55, we find Lava Tank. K36 number 489 seems to appear and disappear behind the sagebrush before coming into view. In slightly less than 11 miles since leaving Antonito, the 489 has gained 600 feet in elevation. curve is located at milepost 295.7. Here the 489 must negotiate the Mesa by climbing three levels of track. The train also crosses the state line three times between Colorado and New Mexico. In the first view, the train enters New Mexico. 
In the second view, the train re-enters Colorado. In the third view, the tracks again reverse direction. After the train reaches the top of Whiplash Curve, it travels parallel to the state line for about two miles before approaching the state line again. Near the third crossing of the state line, the Rio Grande built another Y, known as Bighorn Y. An eating house for passengers stood here at one time. The stub end of the Y was extended in the 1950s to accommodate the long trains used to carry pipe and oil for the Farmington oil fields. On another day, we see Mike 484 pass the Y. Until December 1880, the location now known as Sublet was called Boydsville. A town of 100 people served the area. Now the CNT Mike stop for water near the section and bunkhouses and continue on their way. On another day, we catch Mike 487 as it exits Mud Tunnel and heads westbound to Phantom Curve. We're at milepost 311.5. 
Toltec Gorge is the grandest of scenes on the CNT. Here, Mike 487 heads westbound through a slide area. Although fantastic photography can be achieved from these vistas, considerable caution should be taken in exploring these areas on foot. The rock faces and slides are very slippery, and one misplaced step can send the novice tumbling down to the canyon bottom. We are again at Osier, and the trains are about to meet at the siding where all will enjoy a fine lunch. On another day, photographer Tim Ladd caught a meet at Osier between Mike's 487 and 484. The water tank at Osier is used upon occasion, but today serves as a picture frame for our resting Mikado and train. Toltec Gorge also provides one more grand vista for passengers and more twisting track for the mics. A tender shot provides some exciting clues that we are approaching Rock Tunnel. This tunnel is east of Osier at milepost 315. From across the valley, the mic and train seem dwarfed by the hills as we approach Rock Tunnel.
Near the western entrance to Rock Tunnel, a monument was erected to President James A. Garfield. Rock Tunnel is also called Toltec Tunnel. The curving bore is 366 foot long. Back at Los Pinos Loop, we catch Mike 484 heading west to Chama. A snowshed stood at this location. It was deliberately burned by the Grand in 1920. At the north end of the valley, the track makes a hairpin curve and then begins the climb to the summit at Cumbrance. Near milepost 328, the tracks make a right-hand curve around a rocky hill, then wend their way through a series of S-curves. In order to reach the summit at Cumbres, the Rio Grande had to construct an additional set of loops near the summit. These loops, known as Tanglefoot Curve, came so close to each other at one point that it is said the train's conductor could shake hands with the engineer if the train were long enough. A closer view of the track's proximity to each other shows that the arms of both railroaders would have to be mighty long.
Frequently, trains take on water at Cumbrace, but not today. On another day, we find Mike 487 drifting around Windy Point. The 487's firemen will have an easier time from now to Chama. Back at Lobato Trestle, the 487 gingerly steps across the Lacey Bridge. The train finally arrives in Chama. The rotary snowplow to the right is one of two owned by the CNT. Each retained their original name. OY was built in 1923, and OM was built in 1889 by Cook Locomotive Works. After uncoupling from the train, the 487 heads west to the Y for turning. One leg of the tracks which currently make up this Y was the main line to Durango. When the Rio Grande sold the line between Alamosa and Silverton, it quickly tore up the tracks to Durango. What a great trip could be taken today if the line were still complete between Alamosa and Silverton. These K-36s were the real workhorses of the Rio Grande until the end of freight operations. The Locos weigh 286,000 pounds, and with their loaded tenders, they develop 36,200 pounds of tractive effort. The tenders carry 9.5 tons of coal and 5,000 gallons of water. With the wine complete, the 487 heads back to the Chama Yard.
Meanwhile, the 488 is actively switching around the yard and will head for sanding. On another beautiful New Mexico morning, locos number 489 and 488 move around the yard. Soon they'll be out on the line double-heading a photographer's only freight to Cumbrace. These freights are run at least yearly and offer the video or 35 millimeter photographer the chance to see the K's in action like the good old days. In time-honored tradition, the locos split at Lobato Trestle. The S-curves near Highway 17 offer a grand view of the double-headed freight. Most of the photographers ride in the converted boxcars at the end of the train.
The train smokes up the entrance to Cumbrace, and probably the rail fans too. Another beautiful morning at Chama finds 488 and a masked over Mike simmering in the cool morning air. The masked loco is 484, about to go Hollywood. Quite a number of feature films have been produced on this railroad. This special is going out on the line for the shooting of a film starring Willie Nelson. As the train passes, notice the fake flat car rails and the boxes on the last car labeled Dynamita. Two weeks earlier, the movie crew burned down Ferguson's bridge at milepost 286. Back at Chama, work crews take advantage of the afternoon lull to shuffle a drop-bottom gun to the coaling tower. The crews are preparing to make the coaling tower usable again. The first step is to empty the slack coal from the bin. The 497 is a class K37 and is larger and longer than the K36s. This one was purchased from the Durango and Silverton after the DNS found problems running the loco on their tight curves. The DNS felt the loco was tearing up their track. These 37s were rebuilt from standard gauge 280s with running gear kits from Baldwin. The monsters weigh 300,000 pounds. Another beautiful Chama morning, and engines once more simmer in the cool morning air. Note the two 487 tenders. One is an old shell sitting on a flat car. The real 487 tender sits to the left with its reverse light turned on. It was not unusual for railroads to refit tenders and even loco boilers. By the end of the steam era, many locos were retrofits of other engines. As the CNT continues to restore engines, many mornings find more than three locos simmering around the engine house. The CNT plans on having K27 Mud Hen number 463 up and running by midsummer 1993. The Mud Hens are coming back too. 
Each day begins with the makeup and departing of another train to Cumbrace. The CNT provides more runs to the summit than the Grand did in its later years. We fervently hope this beautiful railroad operation will continue for many years to come. <laughs>